Welcome to Red Mountain. My name is Kyle. It's good to see all of you here. We will celebrate baptisms in just a little bit. Uh, first, we want to walk through a text today that is actually quite complex and uh, pretty deep. Uh, it's probably one of the hardest ones in the book of Galatians. So welcome as we uh, fight our way through these verses. Go ahead and in your Bibles, turn to Galatians 4. We're going to read uh, verse 21 through 5, 1. My desire is that you understand this passage, but not just understand it mentally, but that it, uh, it moves you to grow in, in the grace of God and awareness of his grace. I, I want you to become more convinced of God's benefits and how he wants to work and move in your life. I think the more we grow in awareness of God's grace, understanding God's grace, the clearer our lives become uh, in the sense of the hope that he gets, gives us. So let me pray and we'll dive in. God, thanks for bringing us here. Would you move in our hearts? Would you speak to us in a mighty way? And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Verse 21 of chapter four. <clears throat> Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of, a, of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She's Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it's written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. And what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. A lot of dense stuff in here. Let me, we'll, we're kind of work through a little bit of background in terms of just where Galatia is, is, is at and what's going on culturally, and then we'll work through some Old Testament background, and then we'll hopefully uh, move to some application of, of what Paul's goal is for us in these verses. Uh, verse, verse 29 is critical to understanding the passage. Paul says, just as at that time he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. So regardless of your level of understanding, what you need to see here is that in Galatia, this region of Galatia, there is persecution happening. And Paul is wanting to speak to this church about that persecution. They are being persecuted, pressured, and treated poorly because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul says that's happening because there's this uh, divide going on in humanity. There are those that are born according to the flesh, and there are those that are born according to the spirit. Galatians... They're of the spirit, but people of the flesh who are born according to the flesh are persecuting them. And so that's what Paul is, is trying to say, that there are these two ways of approaching God to carry out his work. It's the children of flesh. And what these children of flesh are, they're, they're following the law, which means they're trying to earn God's favor and blessing. But people of the spirit are not trying to earn anything. They're simply just people of trust, uh, we've seen this in Galatians so far. They have faith. They believe in what God is doing. And that has been uh, around since the time of Abraham. So what Paul is saying to the Galatians, what he's trying to help them understand their persecution is, hey, look, this is nothing new. This is a result of two ways of approaching God. There are only two. You can operate in the flesh or you can operate in the spirit. And the people of the flesh tend to persecute the people who are of the spirit. Paul experienced this. When he went to the re this region and planted these churches, People persecuted him, Jews and Gentiles both, persecuted him because they didn't like the gospel he was proclaiming. In one town, they stoned him completely, and they thought he was dead, and they left him there. And then when Paul's friends got around, he just got up and walked back into the city. 
So Paul is, is gangster like that. No doubt the Galatians, though, are experiencing that persecution and definitely some pressure to uh, abandon the full sense of the gospel and go back to kind of a Jewish way of living because that was part of the persecution and pressure was to go back to doing things where you earn the favor of God or of the gods. There's tremendous pressure there. And what Paul, his overall point here is to say, hey, don't give in to that pressure to fall away from grace, to fall away from the freedom that you know. Don't go back to fleshly living. Stay convinced in the spirit. And that's Paul's overall point. So that helps us as we go back through verse 21. So I wanna walk through 21 through 27 pretty quickly, as, as quickly as I can, but do it as clear as, as possible. Uh, because it's important for our own sense of understanding the freedom that we have in Christ. So Paul starts, tell me you desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? We have a desire to be under the law. That is in us. We desire to have a list to accomplish so that we know we're okay, so that we can feel spiritual and we can feel close to God. That's living in the flesh, Paul says. That's living according to the law is having a list. I think today in our day, we invent all kinds of lists, whatever it is, to make ourselves look and feel spiritual, especially compared to that other person. That guy only went to church once this, this month. I've been keeping track. I've been twice. So therefore, God likes me better and things are gonna go better. That's a, kind of a basic example, but there's all kinds of examples like that where we uh, can operate in the flesh and that debate is happening even today, flesh versus spirit. We have this desire to operate according to the law, according to the flesh. We like to earn things. For it's written that Abraham had two sons. So Paul is going to now use the law to show how the law itself is inadequate. The law is not written for you to follow it. The Old Testament is written to be pro-grace. And that's what Paul is really trying to help us understand. A lot of times we think Old Testament is all law and following rules. New Testament, so that's the good stuff. That's where we get hope and we get grace and man, salvation by faith. And what Paul is saying in Galatians is, no, actually, when you really read the Old Testament, what you'll see is that it's saying, listen, the law doesn't save. You're saved by faith. And so he uses the story of Abraham, goes to the origin. Once again, he did this in chapter three and he's gonna do it again. Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Abram had this promise that he was gonna have a lot of descendants. He waited a long time and nothing. Sarah was still barren. So Sarah and Abraham contrived a plan where they took one of their uh, servants in their household and Abraham got together with her and they had a baby named Ishmael. You can read about this in Genesis 16 all the way through chapter 21. Um, I can't get into the details because of time this morning, but basically this son Ishmael was born according to the flesh, meaning it was, he came about because Abraham and Sarah were trying to uh, get God's promises activated through their own effort. Rather than waiting for God to bring about a child through Sarah, they took matters into their own hands. So it's not the fault of Hagar or Ishmael. Not, there's no there. Paul is just saying, hey, Ishmael was born according to human effort and scheming to achieve God's promises. So he was born according to the flesh. Abraham and Sarah weren't getting a son, and so they went and got one on their own. That's fleshly living. There was this other son, Isaac. He came about, he was born through Sarah, who was 90 years old, 90, 91, when she gave birth to Isaac. He came through promise. And so that's, the, that's what's going on. Abraham had these two sons. One was born according to his flesh, and the other one was according to the promises of God. Paul says in verse 24, this can be interpreted allegorically. What he means there is that it, you can take these as an illustration or as symbols of this age-old debate of flesh versus spirit. On the one hand, uh, you, you have Hagar. Uh, she represents this thing of, of being born out of the flesh because it came about through human ideas and human scheming. And so you have Hagar, Ishmael, and, and eventually Mount Sinai became this, this uh, place where the law was followed and people uh, 
uh, follow rules in order to earn God's favor. And Paul says quite controversially that this is where present Jerusalem is at. So Jerusalem in Paul's day is also on the flesh side. They're disobedient to God. They're not actually walking by faith. That was very controversial to say. That's probably why he got stoned in several places and why they didn't like him because he was basically saying, you Jews, you're no longer following the Lord. Even Jerusalem itself is not following the Lord. And they're going, whoa, pal. We're Jews, we're children of promise. And Paul is saying, not according to the Old Testament and not according to how you're living now. You're enslaved to the law. You need to follow Jesus. He's our Messiah. He's the one that's setting free. That was very controversial, but that's what he's saying. So these are very intense words in Paul's days. And our ears are kind of like, okay, a little weird, but Paul is really throwing punches here. This is, this is incredibly controversial. So on one side, Paul is saying, listen, we have this flesh, and, and that has worked its way through history, all the way even to Jerusalem of his present day. And so all throughout Israel's history, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty awful. As you read the Old Testament, you say, man, is anyone ever going to actually trust the Lord, or are they all going to fall away? Are they all just bowing down to idols? Are they just going their own way? What's going to happen with Israel? It seems like all the children of flesh are winning against the children of promise. There's no children of promise. All the faithful ones in Israel are, are like few and far between. There's like two, it seems like there's one or two guys, and that's it. And so God speaks this message of hope, and Paul quotes it from Isaiah. Isaiah was seeing all the faithlessness in Israel in his day, and everybody was discouraged. Is there ever going to be faithful people? And Isaiah, God spoke through Isaiah to bring this great hope. Isaiah 53 is all about how this servant was going to come and suffer and, and die in people's place for the forgiveness of their sins. And Isaiah 54 is all about restoring then the people of God in Jerusalem. And Paul quotes the first verse of that chapter here. And says, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. The children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. So basically this, this people of faith in God, even though it seems like they're down and out, they're all, the, all of a sudden going to start multiplying because a servant has died in their place. And so that's what Paul is trying to declare as he looks through the Old Testament, as he quotes from, or talks about Genesis 15 and 16 and 21. And then he also is looking at Isaiah 54. He's trying to say, look, the Old Testament is telling this story. And it's the story of God fulfilling his promises in the midst of this great battle of flesh versus spirit. Humans are operating in the flesh, but God is bringing his promises to bear and he's bringing his salvation to bear. And so there is this present day Jerusalem that's disobedient, but there's this Jerusalem from above that is starting to uh, have kids again. And so all over the Roman Empire during Paul's day, People of faith are rising up, popping up. And they're not just Jewish people. Gentiles are being brought in. And we've talked about that in chapters uh, 3 and 4 about how it's not just a, a Jewish thing anymore, but Gentiles are being adopted in. And so the Lord spoke this great hope through Isaiah. And Paul is saying, look, there's this hope that the Jerusalem of faith will bear children once again. So that's the density of of Galatians 4, uh, 21 through 27, Paul is using the story of Abraham to illustrate this flesh versus spirit in order to help the Galatians understand that their persecution is nothing new. That their experience and their story and their place uh, in, in the story is, is part of something bigger. And they are faced with this choice. Are they going to operate in the flesh? Or are they going to operate in the spirit? And Paul's going to keep talking about that as we move through Galatians. But he really starts making his points in, in verse 28. All of this dense Old Testament stuff to get to this. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. What's he saying here? Galatians, don't be afraid because you're on this side of the spirit. Congratulations. I, that wasn't supposed to be funny. Those are just fireworks, y'all. It took me five hours to make those fireworks. I'm just kidding. Just a simple transition. Congratulations, Galatians. You're on 
the right side. You are children of promise. So even though many of the Galatians don't physically descend from Abraham, they've been brought in. This is something that, that Preston talked about and even Alan talked about last week where Paul is trying to say, hey, we're, we're now people of faith. We're children of promise. We're, we're people of the Spirit. And Paul makes this point that they are children of promise. They are the fulfillment of Isaiah 54. And so the Galatians are part of a huge history. They are, they are part of this massive plan of God. In light of this, Paul makes two more points. So three total. First of all, the Galatians are, are people of promise. Second, since they're people of promise, they should expect persecution. That's what verse 29 that we've already read is all about. This is what happens in the world. The people that are of the flesh persecute the people of spirit. That's what happened with Isaac and Ishmael uh, in Genesis 21 that has happened throughout history and it's continuing to play out in Paul's life and the life of the Galatians. You should expect persecution. So what do you do? What, Galatians, what do you do with that? Should you just get discouraged and join the other side? Oh, they're persecuting, so let me go back to the flesh? No, because look at what God says in the scriptures. Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Now that verse has been used or inappropriately in a lot of different contexts, a lot of different ways. All Paul is saying there is that when you operate in the flesh, you are against God. And when you operate in the spirit, you're, you're with God. And that, that these, you can't mix the two. You have to choose you're either going to operate in the flesh, you're going to operate in the spirit. That's the choice before us all. That's the choice that's been before us all throughout history. And so these two sides have two different destinations. One will be with God forever. The other one will be cast out. And that's not, be, that the, we have to be careful there with the slave language. It's not because they're slaves. It's because of the, the metaphor that Paul is using about people being of the flesh. Those people will not win in the end, even though it seems like they are currently, and even though the Galatians are experiencing great pressure. God has a plan. And we have to keep our eyes on the destination of those two groups, people of the flesh versus people of the spirit. Paul then reestablishes that, that, uh, that first point. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Therefore, verse 5, for freedom Christ has set us free. So what does Paul say? In light of being children of promise, you have been set free. Paul says, for freedom Christ has set us free. In other words, Jesus' goal in his death and resurrection was to bring them freedom. Jesus' goal in his death and resurrection is to bring you freedom. That's what he came to do. You have been set free. Now, the, the, the question is, well, set free from what? Two things, at least. Uh, let me read Colossians 2, and it highlights these two things. Colossians 2, verses 13. You who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, which means mean you were dead in your sin, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our sin by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This record of debt he set aside, nailing it to the cross. What are we set free from? We're set free from having to pay the debt caused by our sin. When you and I sin, we create this debt. We, 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 we are supposed to be punished for that. That's what justice says to do, and that's what God, who is just, says to do. Sin creates a debt of payment. What Jesus has done in his death is took the payment in your place and set you free from having to pay the debt. Amen? You're set free forever. Even now, you've come this week, and you might have been a Christian for decades. You've sinned this week. That does not create a new debt that you now have to go pay. Jesus still has set you free from that debt forever and always. Amen? You don't have to pay God back for your sin. Jesus paid it all. And he did that to set you free. That's his goal, that's his mission. He didn't come to do that so then you would start doing things for him. Jesus' mission, Paul says, is freedom, that you can experience freedom. He did it for you. 
He also sets us free from the enslavement of sin. That's what, that's what Colossians is saying. You were dead in your trespasses. You were, uh, Paul says elsewhere, enslaved to sin. Even though you think, as an unbeliever, you can just do whatever you want. You're living your own life. I'm not gonna give my life to Christ or anybody else. I'm making my own decisions. Actually, you're enslaved to sin. You have to sin, and you keep being selfish. And many of us have been living that life, and we've come here because we recognize I'm tired of that life. I'm actually just stuck in selfishness. I need to be set free from this sin. And Jesus sets you free from the enslavement of the flesh, and you can now all of a sudden in him say no to sin. So you've been set free from the debt, and you've been set free from sin itself. And we're now able to say no to sin. That's why Jesus came. You and I have been set free. Paul says, listen guys, you are stuck in sin, but Jesus has set you free. So what do you do in light of all this stuff? In light of being children of, the, of spirit and entering in this massive story of the Old Testament, Paul finally gets to a command. It's one of the first ones in Galatians. It's taken five chapters to get one stinking command. But here it comes, and it's simple. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Paul has worked so hard and he's gone through a lot of complex arguments to simply say, listen Galatians, stand firm in your freedom. If you truly know this freedom, it will help you not turn back to the fleshly living that you once engaged in. Be convinced of this freedom. There has been constant pressure on the Galatians to conform to the flesh, to go back to rule following, to go back to the idea that no, you've got to make this sacrifice so this God sends rain, or you've got to do this so that, that God will bless you. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to celebrate the Sabbath day. All that is to incur God's blessing so he'll do things for you. And Paul is saying, no, you've been set free from that. Stand firm in your freedom. Don't give in to the pressure brought about by actual persecution. They're... they're legitimately trying to hurt them to get them to come over here. Endure the pain. It's worth it. Freedom is worth it. That's Paul's word to the Galatians. They need not join the other side. Stand firm. That's the essence of these verses. As dense as they are, Paul is wanting to build in the Galatians a true sense of their freedom. He's wanting them to understand they're not alone. They're part of this massive group that spans human history and God's interaction of making promises and looking for people of faith. He has been faithful to his promises. He is maintaining his plan. He is steady in his course. Stand firm in your freedom. There's much more we could say about these verses, but I want to basically just come back to uh, us and just uh, give some simple application. And the, and the main question is, where do you find yourself living? Where do you find yourself living? Are you in the spirit? Are you in the flesh? Are you trying to live a life where you're seeking God's favor? Or are you living a life where you're trusting in his promises? Our internal desire is, is to go the fleshly route. It feels easier to stand firm in our list of things that we've accomplished. It feels easier to feel good about your faith when you can check things off the list. I did this, I did this, I did this. I'm standing firm in my uh, legalism, in my following of the rules. We like that. That, that feels right. But Paul is saying, no, that's actually wrong. You need to stand firm in the gospel. Stand firm in the work of Christ. And stand firm in his freedom. I think there's two things uh, that I have found in my own life, and even this week as I've engage this battle between operating in grace and the spirit and then operating in the flesh. I've lost it several times this week uh, and, and also experienced some victory. There's two things that will help you and I trust God more as we live our lives this week. First of all, we need to rehearse our freedom that came by his grace. Speak this truth to yourself. I've tried to, to give you the words for it this morning. I tried to be nice and loving about it, but it comes across kind of a little bit intense about Christ's freedom because I, it's so important. 
I just want you to be convinced of the freedom you have so you can yell that truth to yourself when internally you're wrestling. Man, has Christ really set me free? Does he actually love me? Because man, I just did that. Or man, I've just been in this mode of disobedience or this mode of thinking that's caused all kinds of problems. My selfishness has gotten worse this week. Are you sure Christ has set me free? Yes. Rehearse the freedom. You are free from sin's grasp. You're free from its hold on you. This is what Jesus came to do, is to set you free. Amen? Rehearse the freedom. That's what baptisms is great for today. Rehearse the freedom. These people are declaring that they've got freedom now in Christ. What a great reminder for all of us. And what a great uh, invitation for us to, to, if you've never believed in Jesus, man, look at, look at the change he's bringing. Look at the power he has in our lives to, to set us free truly from this sinful thing. So rehearse your freedom by his grace. Second, be strong in our freedom. Paul says, uh, uh, not just that Christ has set us free, but he says, stand firm in it. The way I would say that today is be strong in freedom. Be more uh, uh, intense about your conviction that freedom is important, that Christ has actually accomplished it. Live in that way. Let that motivate everything that you do. Stand firm in your freedom. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do things. And I, I want to give us a, a little bit of what does this look like to stand strong in three routines. Uh, and I, I chose these routines because these are often part of the list that we create to show how good we are. Uh, and we can operate in these routines in the flesh, but we, I want to show how, what it looks like to operate in routines in the spirit. So the first one is in our praying. Be strong in our freedom as we pray. If we operate in the flesh, we start to pray in a controlling way. We are, we're motivated to pray in order to please God and to get him to do something. Who cares what we pray about? We'll make all kinds of assumptions and say, well, this is happening because I didn't pray enough. Or I didn't pray this way. Or I, 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 my kid is struggling and I'm struggling with my kid because I just didn't pray. If I just pray, then this will go better. That right there is fleshly thinking, as if your effort of just getting down and praying will fix the problems magically. It's not just that you pray. Prayer is awesome and it's good, but what, if we're going to pray in the Spirit, what that means is to not try to control God, but it's to cast your cares to Him. And the opportunity of the struggle, whatever it is, is not a result of you not doing something. It's an opportunity to engage with the Lord. Lord, there's a struggle right now. I don't know what's going on. I need you desperately. Can you please help me? God loves when we cry out to him. God loves when we cry out to him. So that's about, and that, that word casting comes from uh, the New Testament where he says, cast all of our cares in 1 Peter 4. Cast our cares upon him. That's what God wants us to do. Not as a way of manipulating, but as a relational way of bringing God into the situation. Say, Lord, I need your help. Oh. So we don't want to control God in our prayers. We want to cast our cares on him. In our Bible reading, there's a way that we can read our Bible as a way of uh, check mark versus check in. We read our Bibles as a way of checking the mark. We can sit there and, uh, an example, I didn't get that promotion because I didn't read my Bible the last couple months. And we can think that. Oh man, this happened because I haven't been reading my Bible. If I just read my Bible, as if there's something magic about looking at words on this page and flipping the pages. We're not, there, there's nothing magic about just flipping through these pages. Reading the Bible is awesome. It's something that we need to do as believers. It's something that you should do. We'll spend all next year developing a habit in this book together because it's so important for Christians to be reading this and to re be reading it all the time and pouring ourselves in this. But we don't read this to check a stinking box to say, oh, read my Bible. Now God's gonna be happy with me. Watch me pass this test. Reading your Bible is great, but there's a way that the flesh gets involved. And it becomes this way where we're, we're trying to get God to do things for us rather than to check in with God and hear from him. Lord, I didn't get that promotion. Why not? As I read your word today, can you help me understand what do you want me to grow in? I thought you wanted me to grow in my career, but apparently not. Where do you want me to grow? What are you saying to me? Open my eyes to your word. That's spirit-filled scripture reading. And then third, we gotta tell people, 
We gotta tell people about Jesus. Tell people about the great freedom he's brought you. Tell people about his grace in your life and how it's changed you. You're gonna hear these video testimonies of these, these people getting baptized. What great testimonies of the grace and freedom that God has given them. But there is a way that when we tell people about Jesus, it's all about our achievement and what's going well now as opposed to a declaration of our newfound dependence upon God. And so we'll say something like, because we don't want to say the name of Jesus, we'll say, man, now that I'm going to church, my life is so much better. Now that may be true, and I would venture to say that, that most of the time that is true. But I've been going to church, I'm 38 years old, I've been going to church for 39 years <laughs> since I was in the womb. And yes, I think the habit of church has made my life better, but it is not a magical formula. My life has also gone poorly at times, even when I was at church. Just because I'm reading my Bible and going to church doesn't mean life's going to go well. But that's what we tend to think. And so when we start talking to people about Jesus, we we'll say, man, you just need to get to church. Your life's going to go better. And that's not necessarily true because they're going to go to church and then their life isn't going to go better. And I think a great, that, that, that uh, uh, a, a great spirit-filled way is to say, you know, man, ever since God invaded my life and I've been working with him through the situations in my life, man, things are going a lot better. Talk about the connection with God and his grace and the freedom that you have rather than just this list of things that we do. There's much more we could talk about. But I just wanted to give you a, a, a quick sense of what it means to be strong in our freedom uh, and letting the freedom that we have in Christ infiltrate even these spiritual habits that we have and these things that we're doing as a church. Let me pray, and then we're gonna sing a, a song celebrating uh, the truths of this uh, uh, in in our freedom, and we'll also talk about the glory of the gospel, just a great couple of songs, and then uh, we'll begin our baptism time. Pray with me. God, thanks for meeting us here. Thanks for this room of people. Would you continue to help us know you in a greater way and experience your grace? And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.